Right, so we go uh, resume where we left off. We left off at the magnetic equation of state for blazing model in mean field theory. And if you recall the magnetization per particle in suitable units m, this was uh, given by the, the, the magnetic field if you recall h over k Boltzmann t. We solved for it and we discovered there was a solution of the form m minus tan hyperbolic m times Tc over T divided by 1 minus the product of these two. Is it tan hyperbolic of that quantity on the left hand side? Oh yeah, tan hyperbolic is transcendental of this was uh, m Tc over T. And Tc was, if I recall, uh, Tc was equal to it certainly was 2D and then there was a J which is the exchange constant, the coupling constant divided by K Boltzmann. I think that was it, that was all, right. So there is a dimensionality dependence here in this thing in a trivial sense because it just includes, increases the number of nearest neighbors, right. So now we are going to look at it in the critical region and from this we can extract all the critical exponents which we already saw in various ways. So critical region remember that in this problem the critical value analogous to PC, VC and TC the critical values are M critical equal to 0 because it takes off from 0 from the paramagnetic phase to the ferromagnetic. Hc is also 0 because remember that uh, h equal to 0 corresponded to this flat line ending in a critical point in the h versus t plane. Mm -hmm. And of course Tc is non-zero, it is some number given by this. So the critical region says when m, h are small, very near 0 and t is very close to tc. That is the critical region. So let us see what uh, this looks like. Uh, to, lean, to leading order, this equation of state becomes h over k Boltzmann t is equal to m minus tan hyperbolic x here tan hyperbolic x goes like x minus x cubed over 3, the leading behavior. So it is m minus m cubed Tc cubed over T cubed in this case plus etc. times, now this guy here already has an m out here and it is going to be multiplied by another m. Oh yeah, M, M T C over T, yeah that is important otherwise I am not going to get the exponents. You see they assume I make no mistake so they got rid of this, <laughs> I had to prove them wrong. So M minus M T C over T plus M cubed T C cubed over T cubed dot 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 times in the denominator you have 1 minus. There is a minus, yeah, because tan hyperbolic has got to be x minus x cube because it comes down and saturates, so it has got to be negative and that becomes this divided by 1 minus m squared Tc over T and then the next term is T m cubed here and there is an m here, so it becomes m4, we will throw that out. So it is 1 minus m squared Tc over T inverse, which is 1 plus not in this fashion. So if we write this out, this is equal to m 
times this. So, this is 1 minus T c over T that is this portion and then plus m cubed times the first term is T c over T and then there is minus T c squared over T squared from this fellow and then this time here plus T c cubed over T cubed dot dot dot. Did you get a 3 factorial? Oh yeah, this is a 3 factorial, thanks. So this is m cubed over 3, 3 in this fashion, okay. So we are ready to read off various results. Let us give this some uh, name, let us let us give this T c over T some name, we use little t. I am going to use little t, let us fix it, this is equal to T minus T c divided by T c. So we could in principle write it in terms of little t, this whole thing here. But what are the things we want to see immediately? Well, the first thing we want to do first is to find the susceptibility. Remember that chi t equal to delta m over delta h, delta h at constant t and h equal to 0. That was our definition. So all I have to do is to differentiate both sides out here and this is m cubed already. So it is clear that the leading li linear behavior comes from here, okay. And it immediately says 1 over k Boltzmann t is equal to, if I differentiate both sides with respect to h, this is equal to chi t into t minus t c over t or chi t in these units is 1 over k Boltzmann T minus T C. So it diverges at the critical temperature like 1 over T minus T C. Now this is for T greater than T C, okay, so that this is positive. I want you to show that the same result obtains for T less than T C. So show that. chi t is proportional to 1 over t c minus t for t less than of the order of t c, just below t c on that side. The constant of proportionality will not be this, it will be some other number, some number possibly. So it is the same uh, critical exponent, both are to power 1. I have used the fact that m is, yeah, so I have used the fact that this quantity, it is a ferromagnet, it is not a paramagnet, so it orders in the direction of the field and the susceptibility has to be positive, right. So implicitly I have assumed that T is greater than T c, okay. You have to now solve for T less than T c and find the right branch in m as a function of h. This happens to be the right branch for T greater than DC because this is the paramagnetic branch. Yeah, so we have to solve the cubic. Yeah, you have to solve the cubic, okay. Because the susceptibility for T less than TC is the slope at a point where M is not 0 but has finite intercept and you have to find that root and then get back to this, okay. So any one of the roots will do. Right? Either of the roots will do because it was uh, the graph, the graph looked like this. It was like this and like this and we are discussing this slope or this slope and that is going to go like this, okay. So that is a good point. I implicitly by using this alone, I said we are near m equal to 0 but that is only above the critical point. Below the critical point, m is away from the stable roots are m not equal to 0 in the absence of a field, 
Okay, they are the spontaneous magnetization routes. Okay, that is the first result. Then the second one is we can also see what happens at t equal to T c. So we need this result to at t equal to T c we want to get hold of this exponent. So this is m versus h. We want to get this exponent here. How does it behave? What is the power law? We would like to find that. So you set t equal to Tc and of course you immediately see that this cancels, this cancels, this cancels and you are left with this guy. So it immediately shows m is proportional to h cubed, uh, sorry, h is proportional to m cubed. There is a cubic point curve here on the critical isotherm. So that follows immediately from this because this term goes away, these two cancel and you are left with the leading behavior h proportional to m cubed at the critical isotherm. In other words, this is a cubic curve. Then let us ask what happens to the spontaneous magnetization in the absence of the field. So we need to find out 3 at h equal to 0. Now we are trying to find out here is t, here is m, m naught and remember that it goes like this is what we had said. This is Tc and we are trying to find the behavior here in this region having set h equal to 0. So this is equal to 0 and you have to solve this equation for m naught with this set equal to 0. Okay. The root m equal to 0 is always a root as we saw but it will turn out to be an unstable root. We want the non-zero roots. We want these roots, not the zero root here. So you can cancel out m for that and then I leave it to you to show. It is fairly simple. You cancel this out, you, can, you get m squared and then you move it to this side and remember now t is less than tc. So tc over t minus 1 will be a positive quantity, you move it to this side and that will be equal to m squared times something or the other here. So you get two real roots. Show that uh, m, uh, m uh, goes like plus or minus square root of 3 times Tc minus T over Tc to the uh, this whole thing to the power of half. But that is visible there because of course it is immediately obvious. Yeah. yeah. So only that term, right? The first the coefficient of n is not that's right. Yeah. Is you have to be a little careful because there is similar term sitting here. Yeah, but uh, you can do it as a power square. You want near little t so that is long enough. Right? Exactly. And Exactly. It's exactly. You have to check that it is You have to check that that is not 0 identically. That is straightforward to do. Mm -hmm. There are several ways in which you can show from the exact equation that it is going to be a square root singularity. So the critical exponent is a half here. Now these are exactly the same exponents which you get for the Van der Waals equation also in the critical region. Mm -hmm. However, they are not the experimental exponents. Experimentally, what happens is these exponents are somewhat different. Yeah, I am going to do that. That is exactly what we are going to do. Experimentally, you have a whole set of critical exponents. A rigorous way of defining it, but in a heuristic way, there are various power laws of what happens in the critical region near a critical point. Now, these critical exponents have values which are universal for different universality classes. So for the so called Ising model universality class which is what we are dealing with here, we started with the Ising model, you have one set of exponents. For the Heisenberg universality class you have another set etc. etc. Now in the simplest instance and then you have what are called mean field exponents, these are mean field exponents here. So this 
specific heat is supposed to behave C is supposed to behave like I am not specifying C V or C P, I am not going to do that for a minute. I am not going to do that. This diverges like 1 over mod T minus T C. Well, let me write everything in terms of this little t out here. This measures how far away you are from the critical temperature. So this goes like 1 over mod t to the power alpha. That defines the exponent alpha. Then the order parameter either the magnetization, the one that distinguishes the two phases and we are going to take typically one of them to be the uh, one order parameter in the high temperature phase to be 0 and non-zero below just in analogy with the magnetization. Yes. This order parameter goes in the critical region goes like mod t to the power beta. In, in fact, it goes like t minus tc, so it goes like tc minus t. So, minus t to the power beta for t less than tc. While it is 0 for t greater than tc. Yeah, tc. So, the order parameter is 0 and then it branches off in this fashion and we are talking about what happens in that region to the stable route. So, for a gas, if you do concrete gassing, the order parameter will be rho minus rho standard. The order parameter, there is many ways of defining, there is no uniqueness about an order parameter, you could take other things as well. I mean, in the magnetization example, you could ask why did not I take magnetization to the power 3 or 7 as the order parameter, no reason why not, but the most uh, convenient and simplest one. Now, there is no reason why it should be a scalar. For example, in not the Ising class but the Heisenberg class, the magnetization is a vector. Then there are situations where it is a planar vector. No matter how many physical dimensions you are in for the lattice, the magnetization itself, magnetic moments can only move in a plane, say. That is the so called XY model. In the Ising model, they move only in one direction, up or down. So it is a scalar. Otherwise, a two dimensional vector, otherwise, a three dimensional vector maybe an n component object in very complicated systems like in in a thing like li liquid crystal a nematic liquid crystal for example it's an axis okay. a liquid crystal a nematic liquid crystal consists of rod like molecules which are arranged every which way in the disordered phase and if you lower the temperature these guys get ordered so on the average they all point in this fashion of course, there will be small fluctuations about it, but on the average they point along this direction. But there is no distinction between the head and tail, so it is not an arrow unlike the magnetic moment and so very profound consequences follow because it is not an arrow but only a line and that implies that the order parameter is not a vector but an axis here. So in this case it turns out to be a tensor of rank 2 because that will specify an axis. Okay. Headless vector, it is also called a director. <laughs> I did not name it. <laughs> right? I mean, the, it, it produces a line field huh? and it has got defects because it is got a, it's a line field and so on. If you look at your thumb, for instance, I should not get digressed, but if you look at your thumb, you got uh, walls like this, the thumbprint and then at one point there is something like this. This is a defect, a topological defect on the surface here. You should really look at it as something, uh, a point, a line defect really, but in two dimensions it is a point defect here uh, and the directors are supposed to be like this. Such a thing cannot happen if you had arrows because then it means that uh, you are going like this. The 
then what happens on this line? It is a point defect, but what happens on this line? It is indeterminate completely. So, a two dimensional ferromagnet cannot have a point singularity of that kind, but a liquid crystal can. It is called a 180 degree disclination and it has got, got physical effects and so on, very real thing. So, we are all carrying topological defects on our thumbs. Okay. For, so, this is a complicated aura parameter. If you go to more complicated substances like uh, liquid helium, superfluid liquid helium in the helium 4, then the order parameter is a wave function of what is called the condensate, the superfluid condensate. That is now as you know a wave function is a complex number. So, it is a modulus and a phase, that is the order parameter, a complex number if you like. If you look at uh, helium 3, the other rare isotope of helium consists of fermions, that too can become a superfluid and it has got all sorts of magnetic properties and so on. That order parameter is uh, pretty complicated. It is uh, SO3 cross SO3 cross, cross O2. So, it is uh, some 9 by 9 or whatever, it is uh, some 18, 18 uh, dimensional object. So, it has got a lot of physical information buried in it, but the order parameter can be very complex in very many cases. You could ask what is the order parameter in a liquid gas as we said, it could be the difference in densities between the gas and the liquid, but what is it in a crystal as opposed to a liquid, because the liquid and crystal have practically the same densities. Most substances when they freeze, they do not become very much more dense. In ice, it actually expands the other way, but they are equal to each other to within 10 percent. So, what would be a good order parameter in a crystal? Something that reflects the nature of the order, namely that uh, point atoms only sit at regular intervals and so on. So, it would be if you take the density of the crystal, the local density, wherever there is an atom there is a big spike and then there is nothing etcetera and you do its Fourier transform, then it will have components at all the wave vectors corresponding to the reciprocal lattice, that would that set of uh, amplitudes would be your order parameter. Okay. So, it is not a trivial job finding the order parameter in many cases, in some cases, but we know it when we see it, we know it okay. and the order parameter exponent is called beta. In mean field, so whatever we have done is called mean field theory, this alpha is 0. It turns out that in mean field theory, specific heat is predicted to merely be discontinuous, a finite jump and not divergent. This says it is in infinite. As t tends to 0, when alpha is positive, this becomes infinite. On the other hand, you have a, a discontinuity. The order parameter beta is a half in this problem. Okay. Then the so called susceptibility order parameter chi, this goes like 1 over t to the power gamma for t greater than Tc and goes like 1 over t to the gamma prime for t less than Tc. 1 over minus t to the power gamma prime. Okay. In mean field theory, I just uh, uh, showed that gamma is 1 and gamma prime I asserted was also equal to 1. So, the susceptibility exponent is 1 here. Okay. Then you ask on the critical isotherm, what does the critical isotherm's curvature look like? So, critical isotherm this is delta because we found H is proportional to m cubed, P is proportional to minus V cubed and so on in mean field theory. In general, this is some delta.
and in mean field theory this delta. So, alpha equal to this, beta equal to half, gamma equal to 1, equal to gamma prime, delta equal to 3. There are two more, there are actually a few more, there are two more which I will introduce very shortly. So, we have sort of extracted whatever we want from this uh, thing here as much as we can, but I must now, uh, we must now go back and ask uh, uh, where is all this coming from, what about corrections to it, etc. But first some experimental facts. Hmm? In uh, real life, if you look at magnets like the three dimensionalizing model or uh, the or real liquids for instance, then these exponents are very different. For example, uh, alpha is for liquids very close to 0, some small number 0 0.1 or something like that or less. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, superfluid helium, uh, sorry, in the case of the two dimensional easing model, alpha is 0, but the specific heat diverges logarithmically. So, there is a log divergence there. Hmm? Now, the specific heat itself depends on what is kept constant. It is either Cp or Cv or C with a constant field, etc. It depends on the system that we are looking at. So, that is why I did not specify which one it is. For instance, for the Van der Waals model for fluids, Cv continues to be that of an ideal gas in the critical region, but Cp diverges and it is related to the divergence of the susceptibility of the susceptibility in that case, the compressibility. Hmm? So, various possibilities of this can, can happen. In three dimensional liquids, beta is not of the order of half, but nearer 0 0.321, 325, something like that. Hmm? This exponent gamma is of the order of 1.25 it is larger. This delta is of the order of 4 to 5, 4.75 something like that. In the two dimensional Ising model, it is a very special model again exactly solvable. All the exponents can be shown to be rational fractions exactly. For instance, uh, this turns out to be a log discontinuity 2D Ising. alpha equal to 0, but it is a log divergence, log mod t minus t c. Then beta is equal to 1 8, which is really weird. Okay. Gamma is 7 fourths, delta is what? Eclipse of the mind, I mean I am not, I do not remember what is delta. And I am frantically trying to find the relations, I mean there are relations between these exponents. I am trying to see given this can I find it. For instance, alpha plus 2 beta plus gamma is equal to 2. And that does not help us here. Huh? Mm, but it works here as you can see alpha plus 2 beta plus gamma is equal to 2. It will work. It works here too. But I am trying to think of what is the simplest, we, we, it will come back. Okay. But that is because it is dimension dependent, the 2D Ising model. The 3D ones are much closer to real life for various cases. Okay. Now, I want to get straight to the point that uh, what is underlying this whole business and you will see in a minute where, where it comes from is the divergence as I said of something called a correlation length. So, we have to define a correlation length and that will give us a big handle on what to do next. Okay. So, let me define that. What is it that um, by, I mean by this correlation length? You see, in, let us go back to the Ising problem. The magnetization or the moment at each site, lattice site, is your is measuring the order parameter, the average value of this moment. Okay, but you could ask in a thermodynamically homogeneous medium, in equilibrium, at every local site you don't have something which points on the average. It's fluctuating all the time. Hmm? 
So, there are fluctuations and you could ask given the average what is the next the mean square and what is the deviation look like from the average some kind of uh, generalized covariance you ask for and what would it be in the case of the spin problem. You see if you recall we said that the effective field at every point and if you recall we wrote the Hamiltonian again I go back to this as minus j summation over i j s i s j minus h times summation over i s i. I started by writing this huh? and then I said look uh, this could be written as minus this field plus j times summation over j nearest neighbor of i s j summation over i s i. So, the field that this guy is seeing this moment at the ith side is this. This is exact in the Ising model. In the mean field case, we replace this fellow by its expectation value. Okay. In other words, we wrote this field as equal to minus h plus j summation j nearest neighbor of i s j summation over i s i. Well, it is not very elegant notation, so let us minus summation over i s i. So, this is the effective field seen by the i spin. this guy times s i, I added this instead of this. Hmm? So, I got to put that back, right. So, plus uh, summation over i, um, summation over j, j s j minus s j. Okay. You could put a j i j here just to in case it is inhomogeneous etcetera. So, this term cancels out and I get back this term out here. Oh, this is also an s i, the whole thing acting on s i. Now, this guy here represents the fluctuation about the average value of these variables here and mean field theory drops this fluctuation. That is all it is done, it is just dropped it. But we would like to know how important this is, that is the fluctuation at every point. So, now let us define the autocorrelation, let us define, let us call it G R i minus R j. It is a function of the difference in positions of the ith and jth moments is equal to expectation value of S i minus average S i, S j minus average S j. Okay. It is clearly by translational invariance in the thermodynamic limit clearly a function of i minus j. Okay. This is like delta S i delta S j and it will be a function of i minus j. Of course, you can also write this as equal to S i S j minus S i S j. You can also write it like that by a trivial uh, piece of algebra, right. It is a generalization of the mean square deviation at some point. 
but it is now spatially dependent on two indices i and j. Okay. Now let us go back and ask what are these expectation values because the next target is to relate this to the susceptibility. That is going to give us the static susceptibility formula and you will immediately recognize linear response theory in it. Hmm? So the uh, derivation I start with this again. The density matrix. How do the cost terms cancel? Or the expectation? You, yeah, expectations already. There is no averaging of an averaging, it is already average. So trace, so z, the partition function is trace e to the minus beta h. Trace over the fact that each si can be either plus 1 or minus 1. That gives you all the 2 to the power n for n of them and then you take the thermodynamic limit. Okay. So this is equal to trace e to the beta h summation i si plus beta j summation i j nearest neighbors s i plus j. The trace of this whole thing. Okay. Now what is s i itself equal to? Average. This is equal to trace s i e to the minus beta h over trace e to the minus beta h. which is equal to by the usual trick. I want to pull out an SI out here, right? So what should I do? I take a derivative with respect to H, right? That gives me the summation over I, this guy. So let us do that uh, equal to and there is an extra beta which comes out, right? So I have to divide by this beta. So 1 over beta z delta z over delta h. That is summation over i si because there is summation over i, right? By the way, you, you already know this formula. It is trivial. You, you already know this from thermodynamics because you see, let us connect it up. That is a useful exercise because remember that the magnetization M will appear in thermodynamics through MDH like VDP right? and it will be equal to minus delta F over delta H keeping temperature constant. So m, little m, this is capital M, equal to minus 1 over n delta F over delta H at constant T. That is equal to minus 1 over n delta over delta H of minus K Boltzmann T log the canonical partition function. That is the formula for the free energy, minus KT log Z. So this is equal to uh, 1 over n beta delta, so this is equal to 1 over n beta z delta z over delta h. That is what I got here, the same formula. Remember by translational invariance, this expectation value is independent of i and the n of these follows. So each of them is 1 over n times this, and that is your m, little m. So it matches this thermodynamic formula. Okay. So all I have done is to write that, show how that arises directly by doing this. But now comes the interesting part. What is this equal to? What is summation over ij, si, sj equal to? I do two derivatives hmm, with respect to H. First time it will pull down SI, second time it will pull down SJ. It is not this term 
because this fellow the summation over j is restricted to nearest neighbors of i for each i. But this what I am calculating here is over all i and j and that comes by taking this down and differentiating twice, right. And that becomes equal to uh, 1 over each time I pull down a beta. So it should be 1 over beta squared and then a z uh, d2z over dh2. So now let us calculate our green function or our correlation function. So the correlation function was uh, g of ri minus rj, this guy here, uh, summed over ij, I sum over it. This is equal to summation over ij, si, sj minus, uh, minus what? minus uh, summation over ij si sj. The square of this sum I call sum over ij si sj, this factors. That is equal to what? Uh, Let us put this stuff in. It is equal to 1 over beta squared z d2z over delta h2 minus the square of this, huh? 1 over beta squared z squared delta z over delta h whole squared. That is this guy, this correlation. or if you like SI minus expectation SI, SJ minus expectation SJ, same thing. What happens if I differentiate M with respect to H? I should get chi. Huh? So it is clear that chi T equal to delta M over delta H which is equal to 1 over N beta. The derivative of this chi, the field appears here in Z out here. So the first term is 1 over z d2z over delta h2 minus 1 over z squared delta z over delta h whole squared. But there is just uh, this guy here, is not it? There is an extra beta. So it says, uh, you have to tell me where the beta goes. So this is equal to, if I multiply beta, so it is equal to 1 over kt summation over ij g of ri minus rj. There is also an n, there is also an n somewhere, there is an n sitting where? 1 over n. But this is a function of ri minus rj. So I can fix the j and sum over r, fix the i sum over j's and then fix the next i sum over j's. You are going to get the same sum. So I can remove one of the summations and call this coordinate some relative coordinate, the distance between i and j and I can therefore write this is equal to 1 over k Boltzmann t, let us not forget the k Boltzmann t, summation over i g of x i. Where x i means you are centered at i and you are now calculating all the distances to all the other lattice sites. In the thermodynamic limit, you could actually convert this to an integral. Right? You can make put a lattice spacing, convert it to an integral and let us do that in DDEM. By the way, this is called the static susceptibility formula. The fact that this guy here is equal to this correlation. Does not that remind, you see this measures what it does in an external field 
and this is now telling you what the autocorrelation is. So it is exactly like the linear response formula, it is precisely like that, okay. So now let us see what this does. So again we are on chi t is now approximately in the continuum limit 1 over k Boltzmann times t. Now we have a lattice with lattice constant L in d dimensions. Denominator I think. There is a beta squared on top, so that gives you. Yeah, the beta, there is an extra beta going with. Uh, no, there is a. It is okay. It is okay. okay. I mean, I go back to linear response theory. It is yeah. beta times a dot of 0, beta 0, whatever it is, so beta is 1 over kt. Okay. So chi t is 1 over kt. Let us put a lattice constant L and it is in d dimensions. And then you have an integral d d of r g of r. Okay. Now we need a formula for this guy. We need something for this exp correlation, which requires hard work, which requires uh, a little bit of work. But let me state the result, and if time permits, we'll try to derive it somehow. We expect this is going to die down as r increases the correlation between the spin and spins very far away is going to die down. Now it turns out that this fellow here for r much much greater than some correlation length xi, hmm, g of r goes like e to the minus r over xi and this can be shown. So I am going to assert the result and then we will see the consequence and then try to prove that later on. Divided by r to the power d minus 1 over 2, xi to the power d minus 3 over 2, away from the critical region t not equal to tc. And that is chi. Okay. So now look at what is happening. If I put in what I already know for chi goes like t minus tc inverse, so it says t mod t to the power minus 1, this guy hmm, goes like on that side this crazy integral. This does not do any harm, you just replace this by tc, but you got to do this integral, okay. So you have to do an integral, and so only the radial coordinate matters, so it is 0. Only what happens near infinity matters clearly. R to the power dr, r to the power d minus 1, e to the minus r over xi over r to the power d minus 1 over 2, xi to the power d minus 3 over 2. And this integral is 0 to infinity, this guy some cut off to infinity, you do not have to. So, okay. You want the cut off to be larger than n? Yeah, we do not care, it is whatever, it is not 0, and then this blows up. Huh? So now there is a paradox. You have this fellow by assertion, I said that g looks like this, exponentially damped. There is some powers of r floating around. By the way, this becomes d minus 1 over 2. This cancels against this. Okay. This is the phase space factor r to the d minus 1 in d dimensions. Now, this diverges as t goes to tc, but it is equal to an integral which has got this very strong converging factor here. What does it mean? Well, xi certainly cannot go to 0 because if it goes to 0, this will kill it faster than any power here. You do not care. Xi blows up. Xi has to blow up. So xi must tend to infinity as t tends to tc. This 
correlation between spins. I already said the fluctuation effect is going to become extremely strong at the critical region and so much so that any correlation length just diverges. In an infinite system, it goes to infinity itself. The question is how? That is easily seen from here because all you have to do is to scale out by this. So, change variables. Let us change variables to So, this integral goes like integral d r is psi d u. So, there is a d u, then uh, there is a psi to the power d minus 1 over 2 e to the minus u and then divided by psi. There is a psi d u. So, there is that guy and then d minus 3 by 2 from 0 to infinity which is psi to the power d over 2 minus half that is this part plus 1 that is this part minus d over 2 that is this part plus 3 halves times a number. So, this goes like xi this cancels 3 halves minus half is 1 plus 1 is 2. So, we find that in mean field theory, in mean field theory, xi goes like mod t to the minus half because xi squared goes like 1 over t. So, xi goes like 1 over square root of t. In other words, the correlation length diverges like 1 over t c minus t to the power half. That is there is in general. xi goes like 1 over mod t to the power nu. And the mean field exponent nu is a half in the framework of mean field theory. Pardon me? It is inverted for spinning. There is no effect of d as far as this is concerned, but we will see in a minute what really happens. One could ask what happens at the critical point? What happens to the correlation function at the critical point? What does it behave like? I said this formula is true away from the critical point. So, you could ask exactly at the critical point what happens? This fellow becomes infinite and then what happens? Is this formula still true? This is the question we have to ask. This is r over xi is r over infinity which is 1. This goes away. So, there is a power law. So, the question you are asking now is, is there a power law which is, is does it blow up? How does it blow up? It turns out that you can show independently that at Tc, exactly at Tc, g of r goes like 1 over r to the power d minus 2 plus an exponent eta. You have to introduce one more exponent eta. It is not as bad as it sounds because everything this thing is in terms of the correlation function. So, the idea is that away from the critical point, the correlation, two point correlation dies down exponentially with a correlation length at as you approach the critical point that correlation length diverges like with temperature in this power law fashion and at the critical point it becomes an algebraic function a power law dk which is d minus 2 plus another exponent eta out here and all these other exponents can be written in terms of eta and nu and I will write those relations down. Okay. In mean field theory nu equal to half and eta equal to 0. So, if you put those two pieces of information in all the other mean field exponents that we got will jump out automatically. So, everything is now hinging upon the correlation, the two point correlation and characterized by these two exponents eta and nu. Okay. 
how this happens, how this happens and how this happens requires more careful analysis. We will try to do that. That is the starting point of the modern theory of equilibrium phase transitions of the moment. This is the starting point. The fact the recognition that what happens at that point, the reason thermodynamics fails is because the correlation length becomes infinite. You cannot neglect fluctuations whereas thermodynamics neglects fluctuations. It also says something more than that. Even mean field theory does not work. It gives the wrong exponents. And now you could ask what is the region, how close to Tc should I be in order to see the new exponents. This is given by a rule of thumb called the Ginzburg criterion which I will try to mention, but it is not a rigorous statement. We take this case by case as you can expect because what is exact is the universality class in each case. So, it will give you values of exponents, but to tell you how good that value is or when the mean field starts becoming a bad approximation depends on the system. So, it is not universal in that sense, okay. but there are, there are uh, criteria which will tell you. For instance, if there are long range forces then mean field theory is very good. So, so if you ask uh, what about this normal to superconducting transition in metals right, metals become superconductors under suitable conditions, then it turns out that the temperature range in which the renormalization in which you need uh, to correct the mean field exponents is of the order of 10 to the minus 8 degrees, which is negligible. So, unless you hit exactly on the critical point, it does not matter. So, you can get away with mean field theory because there is a long range Coulomb force involved in the problem. But in other places, to spin models and so on, it can the corrections can start appearing much more significantly. So that's not a precise question, but there is such a criterion for this. So we will take it from this point, and the next time I'll introduce the relations between the exponents, the scaling, generalized homogeneous functions. And so on. <laughs>